Hi, parents. I am Erica Jasper, founder of the Center for Confident Parenting and the Special Needs Collective and the mom of a neurodivergent, neurodivergent excuse me, teenager. And in our house, we are starting to think about back to school, which brings a mix of excitement and anxiety. We're actually starting at a new school this year, so a little bit more than usual of both of those things, um, which made me want to bring in some expert help because I'm sure other families are starting to feel the same. So I'm happy to have a guest today, Tara Trivell of To Be Social. She is a mom, a grandma, a certified autism specialist, and has a program called Parenting Powerhouse, which you can talk to us about at the end. Tara, thank you for joining me. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I know you have a lot of great tips to share. Uh, if parents or children or teens are starting to feel um, anxious about the transition back to school, what can we do as parents to help them prepare and then help them navigate that with some measure of ease and confidence? Well, that is quite a loaded question, Erica, of course. For real. And, um, <laughs> and definitely something that is so real. And of course, you know, it's the beginning of August, but um, school is right around the corner. So our kids might not want to think about going back to school yet because they're still having fun in the summer, but we really need to, to think about it to, to start to organize ourselves and them. And as we get closer and closer, the kids are just going to become a little more maybe anxious, um, maybe a little more defiant. Um, maybe, you know, they're just going to give us more attitude, trouble, or whatever. Well, there are a lot of things happening, um, a lot of transitions taking place. So we're going out of the summer, which was a whole new uh, routine from being in school. Then we, you know, we had a transition of the summer. Now they're used to that, having a good time. Now we have to get back to school. And there are so many reasons why they're exhibiting all of these behaviors. It's not because they just want to be defiant or they want to you know, be mean to us or um, whatever it is. It's, it's really not a want in behavior. It's more or less some stress that's coming along with it. And, you know, everything seems to be kind of the same each year. We go back to school, we have some of the same issues. And for our kids, they are dealing with basically a brand new situation. So I like to remind parents that even though they might be going back to the same school, the same classroom, maybe riding the same bus, our neurodivergent kids really live in the moment. So whatever they're feeling in the moment is going to come first. And they may not be able to really think about future, what may happen, the expectations. Executively, they may not be able to put this information together very well. So they might not be able to figure out, well, what might happen? What could happen? What do I do? All of those things executively are not happening. Mm. They get stressed and anxious. Yeah. And what do they do? Their you know, self-regulation skills are not developed. And so they exhibit all of these behaviors. Yeah. And not to throw you off, but am I right to say they are lacking in what to call it episodic memory? Like, it drives me nuts that like a buddy, this happens every year. You go through this every year and then you know that you're okay. Like, can't you pull from the hindsight of past years that that's that they can't because they're in the moment, right? So they kind of can't look ahead or back very well. Right. And they're not processing it the same. And it's different. Think about it. It is not the same as last year. It might be the same school, but who knows what happened over the summer? Did, did something change? Um, something may present itself that didn't present itself the year before the bus, maybe a couple of new people are on the bus. Maybe it's a different driver. Maybe it's two minutes sooner or later. All of those little things, our kids are just not thinking about. They right. can't expect those things. So we can even if it's exactly that. the same, it's different from summer. They're in summer right now. So this is going to be a transition. Even if it's a transition back to the familiar, it's a transition from what's happening right now and from something that's probably a lot more preferred. <laughs> Definitely. And, you know, we have that as well. And, you know, that's, that's what we're looking at is, you know, and honestly, they are transitioning. Every single transition is going to be difficult because of this reason, because of their either working memory, their processing, 
the way they process information. And because they are basically living in the moment, like you said, so any little change. Okay, so let's leave school just for a second because we'll get back into, you know, some behaviors and what to do about it and some strategies and, and tips. But let me take another situation just to, you know, give you an example. A doctor's appointment. <clears throat> okay, kids get stressed. We know that they're stressed about the doctor's appointment. So how do we approach it? Well, we approach it by saying, you know, we've been there before and, you know, what happened the last time and it was okay. And, you know, we could go through all of that with them. But what we don't think about is sometimes those little tiny things executively that they're not picking up on. So maybe the car ride. Sure, they've been on a car ride. They've gone to this doctor before, but they may not really connect with how long are they actually going to be in the car. So that might stress them out. How long am I going to be in the car? Do I have to have conversation with my mom on the way? You know, all of these little things that are actually stressful and we don't really see it that way or we may not think about it and they can't even articulate it because it's not something executively that they're putting together. But this is actually stressing them out. So the more that we can understand <clears throat> as parents and try to take the perspective of our kids um, in this way, it will help us break things down a little bit. And we may not always be right on track, you know, with them, but at least we can try. And it'll just make things easier if we do plug in, you know, where they need to. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, taking a look at this, breaking things down, um, you know, going off to school. And to us, it does look like the same thing. To them, it's a new year. It's, you know, the year might be starting on a different day. You know, whatever it is, some kids really are very routine. And when things are off a little bit, that's where they get really anxious. So these little things, they may not even know it's bothering them, but it, it might be. So whatever we can pick apart, and why not? Why not? If it makes it easier, why not pick it apart and try to, to figure out what could I try to front load or, or plug in for my child to make it a little bit easier? And it may take us an extra few minutes but think about what that may prevent. It could prevent an hour of meltdown. It could prevent hours. <laughs> so um, I think it's- And it it's sounds like fun. the first step is just us sort of mentally preparing and anticipating that even if they can't articulate this, they're seeing back to school ads. We're talking about like, you know, we're talking about going back. Like they're, they're hearing about it. So it's probably on their mind. Their anxiety might be increasing, although we don't know it. And so if we're seeing increases in behaviors, we can just sort of say like, oh, we knew this was coming. We probably know why it's happening. So I think just the awareness is probably the first. How can we be empathetic if we're like, why are you acting like this? <laughs> What's wrong? Really? It's so hard. Oh my time. <laughs> and Erica, that's a whole nother, <laughs> another area here we should probably um, definitely address. I would love to address that with you. But yeah, um, how about us? It starts with us. So that's a whole nother area, right, um, is we just have to observe where we are first um, in order to approach our kids. So, yeah, totally, you know, be be aware of, of what you're thinking and what you're feeling, because it may be very different from what they're feeling or thinking. Uh, honestly, it usually is. Um, it, it's usually very different. And they can't articulate this <laughs> because we've got neurodivergent kids that really have a tough time. Um, emotionally and executively. Um, so, you know, that that is kind of the step that leads us into what to look for, because if we just kind of think about, and I want all the moms to just think about this for a second, drop all expectations, what you think you know, what you think you don't know, whatever it is, just drop it all for a second, because we need kind of a blank slate. And I want you to just think about your last interaction with your own kid. Um, and it doesn't have to be like a difficult interaction. It could be a good interaction. It doesn't matter. Just think about that for a second. And ask yourself, did you truly see things from their perspective? Or was some of what you were putting together in your own mind, trying to figure out, trying to make sense of, was that coming from your perspective? And if it's not totally from their perspective, the best you can, 
um, I'm going to brainstorm some things with you to think about maybe a, a more difficult interaction, especially um, what are some of the behaviors and then what could they be? And maybe this will help you then take their perspective. And you know what? This isn't this isn't all the time. Sometimes they are being, you know, little nudges and, and they are, you know, but most of the time, honestly, they are not. It just feels that way because we're seeing the behavior and the interaction through our own perspective. So we're taking it personally. We're, we're it's it's hitting us in the heart, you know, whatever it is. Right. But they're really coming from another place. So if we're seeing these increased meltdowns as one of them, um, they might be feeling misunderstood or a little overwhelmed with the information and everything. And it might not look like that to us, but to them, they are. And they don't know how to regulate yet. You know, we should be the ones regulating, right? We're a lot older. We <laughs> we should right. regulate ourselves. Theory. First, <laughs> right? But that doesn't always happen either. I mean, that's it's tough. It's not easy. So we have to remember, you know, there's a major age difference here. <laughs> Um, they may withdraw and, you know, that's just sometimes due to that anxiety again, um, maybe too many social interactions with you or with other people in this time of uncertainty, you know, when they are de dealing with going back to school and all the stuff they have to do. I mean, my gosh, it, it can be very overwhelming. Um, and again, I want to bring it back to the executive functioning. Too many things going on. The brain is not able to put everything in order the way it needs to be to be able to think about it in some kind of rational way, if you, if you want to say that. Um, okay, here's a big one. Uh, how about resistance to change, if you're seeing that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> resistance to change. We're seeing it as defiance, right? So they're opposing any like new routines. Um, but this may be, again, executively due to the lack of the preparation that may need to go on in their own brain. We can tell them, hey, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. But to us, we understand all of the whys and we can interpret all of that. But executively, are they really able to fill in all of those gaps with those little whys and understand the actual expectations? So that's why that happens a lot of times. Um, we've talked about the heightened anxiety I have as another one. Um, this could just be you know, nervousness unfamiliar situations. Even if we feel that they're familiar or they're familiar to the child, any changes that could occur um, cause anxiety. Um, another one I have for you is aggression. Okay. Aggression. I mean, that could be slamming the door, you know, yelling, stomping, you know, whatever. <clears throat> Real aggression. As long as it's not like hurting themselves or you, which is a, another area, sit back and think, you know what, this is frustration, this is confusion. What do we do when we're frustrated? I've slammed my computer shut sometimes when I've gotten frustrated. So that can, that can be deemed as aggression, right? So <clears throat> they're just a lot younger. So they're going to show it in a lot bigger ways. <clears throat> so as long as they're not hurting anybody, whatever, this is a time to step back, let them, you know, let them. And then Hopefully, you know, we'll be able to help them understand that, hey, this was a reaction to whatever you were feeling. What was it? And, and try to break it down. Um, so on the opposite end of aggression, we have more, more or less selective mutism, you know, not even saying anything or, or doing anything. Well, this could be really a lack of the insecurity of the, from the confusion that causes the anxiety. Um, here's one that some of us see, some of us experience, um, repetitive behaviors. So this is actually a coping mechanism, um, repetitive behaviors. And, you know, we can, I'm not talking about stimming necessarily, even though, yes, that is one. Stimming is definitely, um, a repetitive behavior. We all stim in different ways. And it's just most of our, our neurodivergent kids, when they stim, it's more, it's more obvious, right? It's an, it's an obvious difference. It's something a little bit, because naturally they're doing what their body wants them to do. They're not thinking about it like we are. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I have a tip for parents. If your kid stims, if they jump up and down once in a while or, or you know, something like that, I challenge you to do it yourself. 
when you're feeling anxious, frustrated, or something like that, just do it. See how it feels. Okay. That will put you in their shoes a little bit more, take their perspective right. just to help them through that. Right. Um, so believe me, I've done it. It's fun. <laughs> and it's the repetition. I mean, I know it's often to provide a sensory input, but in this context, it may be more of like, this is something that makes me feel secure, makes things predictable when I'm feeling insecure about it may be the unknowns about going back to school. Exactly. Yes. Anytime that we have any kind of built up, you know, thoughts, ideas, um, feelings. Yeah. Um, we have to get it out and these guys are just getting it out in different ways. <clears throat> so why not, why not try it? And other repetitive behaviors, um, you know, I don't want to go into too much, but some can look like OCD. Um, you know, is it sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, but that's really for us as parents to kind of observe all these behaviors, what's going on, think about all of these things and try to put that together to find the right resources mm -hmm. um, for that. Um, so another one, okay. We always were taught, well, a lot of us were taught when we were young, look at me when I'm speaking to you, <laughs> right? So that eye contact, we already know eye contact is difficult and it causes anxiety. Why? Because again, the expectation, why do I need to look at this person? What is it doing for me? What, you know, how's it helping me? And it just feels so creepy and uncomfortable anyway for anybody that if you don't understand why you're doing it, then of course it's confusing and, and tough. So the lack of eye contact is, you know, just them managing that social anxiety piece. So, and, so, and the sensory piece, because it can be, if you're focused on looking and listening, it's just multiple sensory inputs, right? So sometimes I'm trying to take the looking away to deal with the listening. Exactly. Yeah. But that and, can look um, like disrespect, disinterest. You know, did you turn away so you could roll your eyes or did you turn away because you don't care about what I'm saying? <laughs> and that can lead to a lot of misunderstanding. Yeah. No, Erica, I'm glad you brought that up because it's very insightful. Yes, exactly. Thank you, you know, for bringing that up because. And, and listen to what you said. It can look like it's being rude or disrespectful. That is our perspective, how we're perceiving that, right? How are they perceiving it? They're perceiving it as this is too difficult for me. You know, I've got to look away. I'm still listening to you. But, you know, but then when our own perspective is, is put in the mix, that's where the breakdown in communication comes from. So, yep. perfect. Thank you <laughs> for mentioning that. That's <laughs> I, so, I speak from current personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know you have a lot of experience. <laughs> um, definitely. So yeah, you've got a teenager. So for us with teenagers, yeah, yeah, we, yep. we get this often. Um, so non-compliance. All right. That can come from a lot of different things, but we're looking at it as, you know, maybe they're feeling a little disconnected, you know, maybe misunderstood or even undervalued. Um, you know, and we're not doing this on purpose. Our job is to try to figure this out. How can we just help them make it easier for them, which in turn will make it easier for the whole interaction, like how we, you know, interact with them and, and help them, right? So I've said a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, well, that was a good list of, I mean, just to sum that up, those are things that we as parents might be seeing our kids start doing now or magnify if it's something they do all the time. And we just want to kind of take a pause and think like this all may be related to anxiety they can't articulate about going back to school and all that means for them. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and in, then in any situation as well. So once we start looking at this and what I'm going to share with you is a little bit of reflective parenting, how that can really help with all of this which would so, never happen if we didn't take that first step right like if we assume you're being rude and you don't care about what I'm saying and you're not listening we're never going to get to the reflective part and these strategies <laughs> nope no so the exactly. recognition comes before that okay got it it does so I mean take a look at this sure they are exhibiting these behaviors and all this is going on with them but really it comes down to beginning with us it really starts with us 
how we are actually perceiving, how we are thinking about the situation, them, and then, you know, that's all reflective um, based on our own thoughts about our own feelings and our own reactions as well. That's the most, probably the, the most powerful piece of all of this. That's why I left it to the end. So reflective parenting, once you've gotten to here, like Erica said, <laughs> once you've kind of realized, hey, there is something else, you know, to really think about here. Um, so then you can start, you know, with the reflecting, reflective parenting piece, which really focuses on, like I said, understanding your own thoughts, feelings, and reactions. So it's removing yourself a bit and working on yourself. And what this does is it's going to make things easier for you. So there are, I have, have that thought of like, we go through this literally every year. Can we just not take that away? <laughs> it's not going to help me be empathetic to my child, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. And, um, you know, I mean, we're growing. We're, we're parents. Parenting is a journey, like a lifelong journey. Our whole lives, we're going to be parenting. Parenting. Um, it just evolves, you know, and so if we know ourselves very well, and then we're going to be able to, you know, develop with, with our kids um, a lot easier. <laughs> That's what we want, right? We want it to be easy. Um, so I, you know, just self-reflecting is number one. So these are all things that um, you can maybe do some tips and strategies to just get started. To maybe just think about it. Not everything's going to work for you, um, but if you can think or about one or two of these things to get started, hey, it's it's a start. Um, so I want you to first reflect on your own experiences and your own parenting style. What is that? You know, how do you parent? You're you're the perfect parent for your kid or kids. You are, and perfect doesn't mean that you do everything the way somebody else does or somebody else want you to do or you've read about or whatever. No, you're the perfect parent because you have a parenting style. You have an experience. You have, you know, kids that are unique and you can pull from different resources, but you're ultimately going to have your own experience as a parenting style. So reflect on that. Just think about, okay, what works, what doesn't work for you and where you are. And that'll just give you kind of a baseline. Then you want to really think about being empathetic and understanding to yourself. So acknowledging your emotions and where they're coming from. What are the feelings that are causing these emotions? It's going to help you to understand a little bit better, like maybe where your kid's coming from. Um, another one is just being mindful and staying in the present moment and Okay, this is a wonderful one. This is my favorite strategy is to be present. Try to get yourself in the moment. And I've got a whole nother hour I could talk about this one. But, sure. <laughs> um, but just being present, honestly, um, it takes us away from any kind of expectation, any kind of like, you know, what I should be doing or shouldn't be doing or what could happen or, you know, worrying about what's going to happen next. Honestly, we are not predictors of the future. I don't think. I don't think you guys are. Who knows? You know, I mean, maybe maybe there are people who can really predict the future. <laughs> but, but I'm I saying, think I'd be. I, I think, think I'd so. have more money, maybe, or something. <laughs> I'd have you know more what? than I have now. <laughs> we cannot predict the future. <laughs> so, what can we do though? We can create it, and the only way we can really create it is to be in the present moment and deal with that moment you know, one experience, one thought, one idea, one reaction at a time to get to the next one. And that's how we're creating our future. So look at it that way. That's a real positive way of looking at it, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Another thing is probably um, just be curious. Be curious and, you know, explore yourself and, you know, things that you like to do or, or don't like to do. Just be very aware. And don't think about the predetermined solution. Don't think about this. I love that piece because I'm a solver. So if mm -hmm. my son is able to articulate, you know, I'm anxious about the first day of school, 
I'm going to come in quick. If I don't take these steps, which I will try, <laughs> I'm going to come in quick with like, oh, buddy, you know, we go through this every year and you get all worked up and then you get through the first day and it's fine. And, you know, no big deal. <laughs> or like, hey, how about we do, you know, A, B and C to get you ready? And he's like already bombarded. And like she doesn't get it. She's glossing over it. You know, what if those solutions don't work for him? Um, so I've tried to go more of like the the consultant coach route of like validate. Like it sounds like you're really anxious. You know, I remember being anxious on my first day of school, new school, you know, new girl, new layout, whatever. Um, you know, I'm I don't remember exactly what helped helped me, but you know, let's think about it. Um, that would be a better. I guess I'm trying to pose this as a question. The latter would be better than the former of what I described, right? <laughs> well, you know what? And and every interaction or experience is going to be a little bit different. So you're going to you're going to want to try different things. Um because, you know, when you are sharing what you're thinking, that's helping in other ways. You know, that's helping him to become more aware of what else or what else can he be thinking about or how he could be thinking about things. You know, so it's opening up the world, even if it's not in the moment, he, that's going to sit with him for a couple of days, a few days. And you know what, maybe something will resonate with him and it'll click. And then he will be able to articulate um, something else that he was thinking or, or needing. So, yeah, all of it leads to, you know, something. And um, but, you know, the predetermined solutions. Yeah, that's it, it's hard for us not to go there. It's really hard. Um, but we just have to remember, you know, we're dealing with somebody, you know, 30 or 40 years younger than us. <laughs> They're not there yet. So we keep that kind of in the back of our mind. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, which leads into the next one that I was going to talk about, which you just said, basically communicate, you know, openly and honestly, you know, with your child. Um, when I say openly and honestly, you don't need to give them information they don't need. <laughs> but <laughs> we know that, right? Um, but just be honest with our own feelings, you know, and honestly, sometimes we can tell them, you know what, I'm, I'm just really confused here. I want to help you. If you don't, if you don't know, you know, what you need right now, fine. You know, that's okay. Let's just, I'm just letting you know that I, I'm concerned, you know, and, and I'm here, you know, and I, I understand. And like you said, validate the feelings. Um, and then this is, this last one, I want you to take kind of with a grain of salt, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, of course, we're always trying to model healthy behavior, right? I don't have to tell you that, <laughs> um, but our kids don't learn from modeling very well, mm -hmm. um, or maybe they do learn from modeling very well, but they don't use that model behavior in the correct context. <laughs> so that's where they mess up with their friends and everything else because they're trying to model. Um, so still that's, those are the executive functioning skills, you know, where, okay, they can model this behavior because they see it as getting good results for the other person, but they don't really know how to put it together for themselves, um, and generalize it into, you know, other experiences, which are going to be different. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So, you know. If we just practice ourselves, you know, some self-awareness, talking to them like the last two, um, you know, and empathizing with them, empathizing with ourselves out loud, then that can at least give them that um, feeling of connectedness to us, that they're not alone, that they, you know, whatever they're feeling, there is a reason behind it and a valid reason. So that's, that's how I would look at modeling. Yeah. And can you give an example of that? So we can just hold on to that thought better. How would you, what's something you might say out loud in front of you know, your grandson? My grandson? Oh, I do this all the time. So um, <laughs> because I may get frustrated with something, um, like if I'm burning a piece of toast or something like that, and I might be like, oh my gosh. But if I'm going to say that, then he may not be connecting what that is all about. He might think it's you know, because he's in the room, it could be something that he's doing or done. So right. then I, I just speak out loud. I'm like, oh, I burnt this toast. And I'm, you know, kind of mad at myself right now, because now I, have, I wasted it, you know, whatever. So I kind of, you know, talk out loud sometimes just so okay. that he 
can make the connections. And that's just like a simple little one. But, you know, even for even for big things, like when I'm doing something new, like maybe I have to drive to a new place and he's in the car and I might be a little anxious or nervous um, about the timing, you know, whatever. So I may just say that out loud. And honestly, Erica, what it does for me is that actually regulates my emotions as well so that I don't get too uppity. I'm just like, okay, this is how I feel about this. And I can maybe laugh about it with him or, you know, whatever. And it just helps <laughs> regulate me as well and makes the whole ride a little easier. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I love this because a lot of the support that, you know, we offer families and a lot of the videos we do is, you know, it's really for the, for the kids. <laughs> There's a lot of support geared toward kids, but your support is geared toward us, the parent and how we navigate them while they're navigating whatever they're navigating. And I think that's really important because, you know, but it's a hard gig. And if neurodivergence is factoring in, it's, it's probably harder or harder and hard in different ways. Um, so on that note, tell us if a parent is like, I love these strategies. I want more. Um, you have a new program that's available. Can you touch on that before we wrap up? I do. Yes, Erica. Um, I have a new program, uh, my signature program, Parenting Powerhouse, which is um, I launched in the spring and it was um, live, like Zoom sessions, but now it is all pre-recorded. I have lessons pre-recorded, awesome. so it's at your own pace. Um, it's packed full of so much that just is there to support you as a parent, to get you to this point of confidence and peace in your parenting and learn how to do it reflectively, you know, okay. build yourself up. And I'm here as your accountability partner, as well as a whole um, group of moms, wonderful, dedicated moms. So in this, we not only have the lessons, but we have a private a supportive community that, um, you know, helps each other, supports each other back and forth every day of the week. And then I have weekly um, live Zoom sessions, which are, it's like an office hour. And this is where I support you in your journey, whether it was in the course or in your life daily, you know, whatever comes up, your questions, your concerns, just like this, trying to, to guide you and help you. Um, and uh, this is lifetime access. This program is lifetime because parenting never stops. You know, like I said a little earlier, it only evolves and you need to learn to to evolve, you know, with with your kiddo, because when they become teenagers and young adults, we're still parenting and okay. it just becomes so difficult sometimes. Yep. So, yeah. Absolutely. So visit me at parentingpowerhouse.com. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for letting us know that that's available on demand. I'm sure that will make it easier to access for people who are super busy, which I'm sure we all are. Um, and thank you for sharing these tips. Hopefully that will help us to navigate this back to school transition with some confidence and loads of empathy. I know we're going to need it. Um, and I'll get this out to our audience just in time. Thank you so much, Tara, for joining me. You're welcome, Erica. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye.